Good afternoon. Welcome to the first webinar of the Living with Highs and Lows webinar series. Before we begin, um, I just have a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, if you wouldn't mind clicking on the hand icon in the console, that way I'll know that the audio is working. Great. I'm seeing some hands, so it looks like everything's okay. If you have any questions about um, the founder of the, of the webinar, don't hesitate to put those in the question box. Due to the number of participants in today's event, all attendees are muted, but we encourage you to submit your questions and comments at any time using the question box. We'll compile them and share them during the Q&A later in the webinar. The session is being recorded and will be posted to the webinar webpage where you registered. Lastly, we've included a few polls throughout the webinar in order to get a better sense of who's joining us today and to get your feedback on some of the team's ideas. Those responses will not be attributed to individuals and we hope to hear from you. So with that, I'll turn this over to John Calort, Emerging Opportunities Program Director at the University of Michigan Graham Sustainability Institute. Thanks, Maggie, and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is John Calort. Uh, I'll be getting us started today, and thank you for joining us for this first uh, webinar in a four-part series that's a part of this integrated assessment on water level trends. Um, I'll be uh, talking a little bit about the overall project, the overall integrated assessment, giving a little bit of information about uh, water level trends for this first seminar, uh, first webinar, and then uh, turning it over to our presenter for today, Dave Hart from the University of Wisconsin. We'll then uh, spend some time towards the end for questions and discussion, and then uh, give our presenter, Dave, uh, the last few minutes if there's any kind of wrap-up comments that he would like to make. So as I mentioned, there are uh, four sessions in this. This is just the first of four. So if you have not signed up for any of the upcoming three events, you can still do that on the project webpage. And everybody who has joined in today will receive a uh, kind of follow-up email with links to this presentation and the overall project website, which also has the links for registration. Uh, but this project is built around four different teams that are each looking at lake levels in different locations throughout the Great Lakes region, primarily Michigan and Huron. So we're looking at uh, the project team that's working in Wisconsin this week. Next week, we'll be hearing from the folks that have been working in Ontario. Uh, right after Thanksgiving, uh, we'll be hearing from the team that's working with uh, tribal communities around climate change and lake level impacts. And then our last one on December 8th, we'll be looking at land use regulation and infrastructure policy in Southwest Michigan. So again, if you'd like to join any of the other ones, uh, please do that. Uh, be great to, to have you uh, join us for all of these. Uh, we're doing this at this point uh, so that we can kind of share the work of the project as broadly as possible and, and gather a little bit of feedback that we can share with the teams in this type of webinar format. Uh, we've um, had over 189 people register for this event from 12 different states and provinces. Uh, for this one, it's mainly uh, participants from Michigan and Wisconsin, but we also have folks from California and Texas and Ontario and New York. Um, so uh, great to have such a, a wide uh, range of folks uh, joining with us today. And uh, those participants are, are representing uh, various state uh, uh, government organizations, uh, local government, both city and county uh, folks, uh, private sector folks, and uh, conservation authority representatives from Ontario. So let me talk a little bit about what an integrated assessment is, because this is the overarching frame that we're using for this uh, project, and it's kind of guiding our work and providing the methodology for this work. So an assessment is generally a review and analysis of research and data related to a specific issue. And for this one, the, that issue, as you've seen in the materials we've been sharing, is about water levels within the Great Lakes, um, particularly with the teams that are a part of this project within Michigan Huron. And that assessment seeks to integrate po uh, policy or management context, uh, diverse stakeholder perspectives, multiple disciplines, and look at an analysis of causes and possible solutions to the issue that's being examined in order to build consensus and inform decisions. So really most integrated assessments are directed towards developing an analysis of options. Uh, doesn't take things through to, to implementation. Uh, 
that's left to uh, local decision makers and that's why you're going to hear from all of our teams have been working closely with local partners that are uh, best positioned to put the, uh, the analyses into action. So this assessment, our guiding question, has been looking at what are the environmentally, socially, political, and economically feasible policy options and management actions that people, businesses, and governments can implement in order to adapt to current and future variability of Great Lakes water levels. The key impact areas that we're looking at are the uh, types of infrastructure, shoreline economies, nearshore and shoreline habitat, water quality, and recreation and tourism. Just a little bit about what's been happening uh, with water levels in the Great Lakes. Uh, I think many of you are familiar with this already, but if we have anybody that's not so familiar with water levels within the Great Lakes, here is some information that I took from the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory uh, dashboard, and the website is right there if anybody would like to explore it themselves at some point. But if we look back over the past 20 years, we see that uh, so each dot is a month uh, the, the level reported per year from 1997 projected through uh, the start of 2017. And we can see that that red line is kind of the historical average. And for the past 20 years, uh, things have been uh, below, uh, below average. Uh, in fact, in 2013, uh, significantly uh, lowered some historic lows in the Great Lakes. And then over the past couple of years, that has gone up quite quickly. Uh, we're now above average, uh, but the projections toward the right end, those kind of red bars, are kind of a range of what we might see over the next coming months. So I guess the general story is that over the past 20 years, it's been below uh, average. But if we then look back over the past 100 years, so it's really great that we have this type of information, we can see that we're dealing with water level variability. And so that's the approach that we've been taking with this uh, integrated assessment is to you know, look at, we recognize that uh, water levels go down, water levels go up. Uh, perhaps we might be seeing periods of greater variability within water levels. So what are the uh, things that we should be looking at, the strategies, the approaches that we should take uh, to look at uh, the changing water levels within the Great Lakes? Um, so we've uh, had four teams uh, look at this. Uh, let me just talk uh, a little bit more about our purpose and who's been involved. So we want to equip the region with a robust set of, of strategies to address uh, the challenges of water level variability. We really want it to be place-based too. So that's why each of these teams has been working in a very specific location kind of throughout uh, the Great Lakes, again, primarily within uh, Michigan Huron. Uh, deeply uh, engaged with local stakeholders uh, with the objective of trying to build local ownership over topics. Um, but we also know that uh, there probably are going to be ways that we can take these uh, local learnings from each of these teams and extend them to other parts of the region too. Uh, we're fortunate to have a, a multi-sector advisory committee that has been working with us for over two years now. Uh, representing a wide range of, of organizations, uh, government organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, researchers uh, that have been working with us to provide input to help us uh, gain access to information or different organizations that are interested in this topic. So I just want to say a big thank you to all the members of our advisory committee that have been uh, working with us and informing this work along the way. Uh, and finally, just a little bit about our timeline for this, uh, how things have been progressing. So we've been working on this for about two years. We started with a series of planning grant teams that worked for about six months uh, last year to look at, you know, would it be possible, is it going to be feasible to conduct an integrated assessment in a specific location and around a particular topic? And those teams completed their work uh, last year a little bit over a year ago, and those summary reports uh, you know, were, were shared with their partners, and we've got uh, kind of summaries of all that work on our project website. Uh, we then moved into the integrated assessment uh, phase one, which involved four analysis teams, each providing an interdisciplinary overview and synthesis and report of status and trends, causes and consequences of things uh, within their particular region. Uh, then within uh, the second phase, which we're just wrapping up now, those teams worked with stakeholder input 
and each analysis team developed a report analyzing viable policies and adaptive actions that could be considered uh, for that local uh, um, area with the, the issues that were identified. And then finally, we're going to move this forward uh, from this point through the next several months to kind of pull together the work from the four teams to kind of see what are some common themes and strategies that we can identify and prepare a final comprehensive integrated assessment report and uh, select options, uh, both for the specific locations, but also for the region altogether. Uh, at this point, we're going to try our polling system. I'm not sure, uh, Lovell, you're able to, to implement that. So this is just to kind of get comfortable with this polling uh, process. So you'll see something pop up on your screen. We're going to ask you about your levels of concern, whether that must uh, is about low levels or high levels or you're not certain. So you should see that on your screen now. Just select the option that best matches your uh, concern or perspective on this topic, and we'll give that about a minute for folks to kind of roll through. Okay, we've got about 80% of you. We'll just give that another couple of seconds. Thank you. It looks like that's working great for everybody. Um, and great. So why don't we close the poll and we show the results? So I don't. See. So it looks like uh, uh, most of you are concerned with both high and low water levels. That, I think that speaks to our experience over the past couple of years. Um, and then after that, uh, concerned primarily with high levels, and then a smaller number concerned with low levels, and just a few people reporting that they're not certain. So thanks, and it looks like that worked fine. So we're going to have, we're have a couple of polling, additional polling questions uh, later in the presentation, uh, specifically geared to the project that we're going to be here about today from the folks in Wisconsin. So with that, we're going to turn it over to our presenter for today, uh, Dave Hart. Uh, let me just uh, introduce Dave a little bit. He's with Wisconsin Sea Grant and the project lead for the Wisconsin team as a part of this integrated assessment. Dave brings extensive experience working with local government and coastal constituents, uh, and he also has both a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of New Orleans, and he has his PhD in land resources from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So with that, Dave, we're going to turn it over to you to hear about the work of your team in Wisconsin. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, at some point, do I accept, uh, accept the presenter mode? Yep, just shortly. Okay. <laughs> there we go. All right, Perfect. is that working then? You can see the see the presentation? Yes, we can. Thanks. Right, excellent. We'll get started. Thank you, John. And uh, you know, the Wisconsin uh, Integrated Assessment is going to focus on uh, uh, coastal bluffs and Lake Michigan water levels for an area just north of Milwaukee. And uh, before we get started here, I just wanted to thank the University of Michigan for their support of this integrated assessment that we're working on. So what I plan to cover today is a little bit of background about the project area and the people and partners we've been working with and some of the water level challenges we're addressing, uh, how we approached uh, public engagement on the second phase of the project, the range of response options that we've uh, put together, and how we've looked at uh, rating those, those options and where we're heading from here. So that's, the, that's what we're going to cover here. Uh, the project area is an area uh, about 28 miles of shoreline north of Milwaukee from the village of Shorewood to the town of Port Washington. Um, there are eight municipalities in our study area, uh, four villages, uh, two cities, and two townships. And if you look at the map of the coastline, um, the, the color of the shoreline represents uh, the conditions of the bluffs back in 2007. So if you see a green coastline, generally the bluffs are more, were more stable at that time. If you see red or orange, um, there was less bluff stability at that time. So it just gives you a little bit of an overview of, of what, we're, what we're working with and we're covering parts of two counties. Uh, the project team, 
Um, the more immediate group of people uh, associated with Wisconsin Sea Grant and our, our, coast, uh, our coast team uh, include uh, Gene Clark, who's a coastal engineering outreach specialist uh, up in Superior, Wisconsin with Wisconsin Sea Grant, Deidre Peroff, who's our social science outreach specialist in Milwaukee, Julia Nordyke, who's our coastal storms outreach specialist in Green Bay, uh, Andrew Mangum, who's a, a graduate student in the Gaylord Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, and Adam Beckley, who's the Phil Keeler uh, Fellow um, with the Coastal Management Program. And finally, Bert and Linda Stitt, who are longtime uh, community engagement specialists and who really helped out on this project. And our investigators are that multidisciplinary team of scientists who've, uh, who've been giving us guidance as we've gone along. And so you can see they represent uh, fields ranging from aquatic ecology to geology to planning and law, uh, beach health, civil engineering. Um, and uh, you can see the, the, the pictures and the names of the faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee who've, who've been giving us guidance on this project. Uh, our project partners include those organizations with a broader perspective, typically state or regional perspectives on this issue, um, and include our state's coastal management program, Department of Natural Resources, and Emergency Management Department as well as the Southeast Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. And we're fortunate to have the Association of State Floodplain Managers uh, with their headquarters here in Madison. So those are uh, the, uh, the types of another range of uh, groups that we've been working with on this project. Uh, the water level challenges uh, that we're addressing include uh, changes to beaches and beach uh, above toes due to the higher water level levels that we've seen since 2013. Um, also of great interest are the impacts uh, that shore protection structures um, have, and as well as um, changes to uh, the lake bed and bluff base and bluff top. Um, and I'm going to include a, a series of oblique photos. This one was from the Army Corps of Engineers flight of the Great Lakes in 2012, and it just gives you a little bit of an idea. This is um, uh, uh, that the bluffs in the area typically range from 80 to 140 feet in height. And uh, this is an area just south of the city of Port Washington in Ozaki County. So uh, as part of our phase one um, synthesis, uh, went, going back and looking at what information we had, one of the key pieces of information uh, was from uh, Professor David Michelson, um, a geologist, uh, who uh, uh, looked at the, the status of, of armoring or shore protection along the Lake Michigan shore. Um, and showed from 1976 to 2007 that the, uh, in Ozaki County, um, the, the percentage of, of armoring of the shore increased from about 10% to 27%, and in Milwaukee County increased from about 45% to 63%. The increases were even higher south of Milwaukee and Racine and Kenosha County. Uh, and this uh, photograph uh, uh, is, is for an area in the town of Grafton, again, in Ozaki County. So again, uh, more of an idea of what uh, this, this coastline looks like. Um, so, so as a result, perhaps partly because of this increased armoring of the shore, as well as the longer period of low water levels we've seen, uh, from uh, 1976 to 2012, there had been a trend towards more stable coastal bluffs in the study area. And uh, again, David Michelson um, looked at bluff profiles in the project area, 48 of them, and analyzed uh, the factor of safety, which is a representation of the stability of the bluffs, and showed that 90% of them in that time period increased in stability, 4% decreased, and 7% remained unchanged. Another perspective, again, this is from Dave, um, uh, of this is uh, uh, looking at it through a bluff profile. And in this particular case, you can see the dashed line represents a bluff profile in the 1970s that's more steep um, in slope. And as you've seen the stability, you've kind of seen a, 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 a lesser a, a bluff slope angle here, but also uh, as a result of looking at 2012 data, an accumulation of material at the base of the bluff. So again, this is another representation of that trend that we've seen in the previous slide. So what we do know that things have changed since 2012, and this rapid uh, uh, level that, that John mentioned um, is causing concern uh, among property owners and local officials. Um, and in recent years, uh, uh, we've seen waves that decrease beach width and, and waves reaching the bluffs and causing failures. This is actually 
um, an oblique photo taken by the Civil Air Patrol in Wisconsin in June of 2016 in Racine County, south of Milwaukee, where they've been having some acute issues with bluff erosion and some infrastructure and houses um, uh, in peril there. Um, finally, looking at our study area, um, Dave uh, Michelson has, uh, took uh, uh, oblique photos in August of 2016 and has begun to take a look at those. And as, as to, you know, between 2012 and 2016 has seen relatively little change in bluff stability. There have been some areas, and this represents um, um, an area in the city of Mequon where you can see uh, the lack of bluff and the, the clear path for waves to strike at the, at the base of bluffs and what happens uh, when, that, when that happens. And uh, one thing that Dave has, has noted that um, the changes in bluffs typically take a little bit longer uh, to show up on higher bluffs like we see in the north area of Milwaukee, then, uh, and maybe that explains some of the quicker response that we've seen in the lower bluffs uh, in the area south of Milwaukee. Oops, I'll go back here and uh, we'll put our first poll question up and I'll turn that back over. Have you seen accelerated bluff or shore erosion as a result of the increase in Great Lakes water levels since 2013? Got responses from about half of you. All right, make your last selection. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close it. It looks like 60% of you have said yes, about 11% has said no, and about 29% of you have said not applicable. Okay, thanks, Maggie. I'll move on here. So, um, getting more at the activities that are associated with phase two of our integrated assessment, uh, over the summer we held a series of community conversations, again, again guided um, and, and structured by the community engagement specialists that were working with Burton Linda Stitt. The first one was for the northern third of our project area covering Port Washington and Grafton. We held that in June at the American Legion Hall in Sockville and had an attendance of 45. Um, in July, we had a meeting in Mequon, which represents the central component um, of our project area. Um, and, and finally, uh, in August, we held a meeting that represented the uh, four coastal villages in northern Milwaukee County uh, with an attendance of uh, 43. Um, and so the, uh, uh, the agenda for those meetings, uh, they, they were approximately two and a half hours in length. They happened during weekday evenings. Uh, we held an extensive welcome and introduction um, uh, to get started. Then we had a presentation that focused uh, on providing a background on water levels and how they've been changing and what the response has been uh, with coastal bluffs. And particularly because a lot of uh, people we were meeting with were experiencing uh, erosion or issues, uh, we talked about some of the resources that were available through the state, through Wisconsin Sea Grant, to be able to better understand these issues. Then we broke to a, a brainstorming exercise that looked at what were uh, people's hopes and wishes and concerns and issues for the future of coastal bluffs and shores in their area. And then finally, we had a closing reflection that let, let people uh, respond to, the, to, the, to what had happened um, uh, at that meeting. Uh, so a little bit more reflecting on those summer meetings, um, one of them was the great benefit of working with uh, experienced community facilitators, just in selecting locations for meetings and organizing the chairs and talking about, you know, how we presented information. It was really, really valuable to have that expertise. Um, the introductions let us know who is in the room, and that's a very important um, element of these types of public meetings. Um, the presentations we gave evolved as we went along, uh, particularly in relation to some of the questions about what was driving lake level change um, that we received at the first meeting in the northern part of our study area. And so we were able to dig back and improve presentations and gather more um, uh, information to communicate some of these ideas as we went along. 
Um, the, uh, the brainstorming session, you know, we ended up with a collection of sticky notes, but that was very important because um, it allowed community identification of issues and the seeds for some of the potential options or for maybe in the longer run potential solutions out there. And then finally, um, the reflection was very important, uh, allowing people to, to kind of process on what happened there. Um, in, in all three cases, these meetings, there was a lot of, of concern and, and, uh, and, and angst perhaps in the room because of what was happening. But in all cases, when we got to the end, that reflection allowed the meeting to end on a, on a high note. And, I, and, and that, like, reflecting back on these meetings, I thought that was very important. Um, so again, um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the sticky note exercise or this, this hopes and wishes exercise allowed people to get up and stretch out and, and, and put some ideas down, but also have conversations. And I know, uh, you know Bert would, would tap me on the shoulder and say, look over there, look at that discussion. This is a good thing coming out of this process. So quickly, some of the themes from the summer meetings. Um, first of all, we hear, heard a loud voice for collective action. Um, and that may be through cooperation among neighbors. We'll hear a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, or what uh, type of ways our people can work together to, uh, to, to find some solutions. We, we had some changes recently in state shoreline zoning uh, in the state. And there's some questions about what those changes meant for the bluffs. People certainly had questions about coastal processes and bluff processes, and there were definitely questions and, and a need for education about um, bluff stabilization solutions. There, was a, there were questions associated with what's driving lake level um, changes and uh, how do we explain this variability. And finally, uh, particularly in the third meeting, there was a strong focus on environmental quality issues, uh, 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 a miss, you know, what's happened to our beach. Uh, so at, at this point now, with this kind of information that we gathered and we started to develop um, some adaptive actions, or as we call them, response options. We went all the way back to our planning grant to some interviews that were conducted there. We went back to our phase one synthesis report of the research and data that was out there. We started to compile our initial ideas in a Google spreadsheet. We reviewed very deeply the, 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 the brainstorming uh, results. Um, the hopes and wishes that people had and the concerns and issues. And then Andrew Mangum, our graduate student, um, uh, went out and conducted interviews with our partners and our investigators to really pull out some of their ideas for response options. And 11 interviews were conducted in this September. And then um, Andrew, together with Adam Beckley, who's uh, the Keyword Fellow at Coastal Management Program, um, helped to develop a PowerPoint presentation representing 29 options, response options. And each one of those had a definition, a photo, um, uh, the benefits and disadvantages of the approach, and a summary. Um, and so to, I don't have time to go through all 29 options, but I can kind of go over the themes. And the first category, broad category of three, were structural approaches. And the themes were the traditional gray infrastructure uh, approaches that we see out there, like revetments and so on. Um, then the second theme was um, green infrastructure, green living shoreline approaches. And the third theme was a greening of the gray infrastructure approaches. And each of these, there was anywhere from probably three to six options um, represented here. The second category were policy options. And again, three themes. Um, the first played off this idea of collection act, collective action that we heard. The second uh, focused on uh, changes to permitting. And the third focused on changes to ordinance, uh, ordinances and policies. And then finally, um, our third category was uh, outreach and education um, resources, decision tools, and so on. And we decided just to uh, focus on the five broad categories here of educational resources, outreach activities, maps, tools, and, and analyses that could be done. Uh, maybe at a further date, we'd break this out and go into more detail um, in, 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 these, in this area, in this category. Um, just to go into um, uh, uh, what one particular theme looks like, the gray infrastructure approach. Uh, again, you can see the six options here, revetment, seawalls, breakwaters, groins, bluff regrading, and groundwater discharge or groundwater drainage. Um, and then this gives you an example here of 
what one of the options look like the analysis for this. And so you can see a revetment, a protective structure of stone, concrete, or sandbags parallel to the shore with a sloping face to protect against wave erosion. The benefits is it resists erosion uh, uh, of the toe or shoreline by waves. It's strong and durable. The disadvantage is, it, is that it can result in increased erosion of adjacent natural shorelines. Uh, you can have a loss of beaches and natural habitat, and it prevents sometimes needed sediment flow into the lakes. And uh, it can limit water access because they're hard to make your way over them. Um, and then down at the bottom, you see some of the topics here on the summary. When is this necessary? Uh, with the scale being either at the property owner individual level or a group action. Complications are on bluff areas. It could be tough sometimes to get down to the site and the cost medium or maybe medium to high in, the, in, in this particular range. And so here we're, we'll present a poll question that kind of uh, uh, reflects, uh, you know, the questions that we asked of, of the public uh, for these different options. Such as what do you think about revetments as an option for addressing bluff erosion? So the, the first is, uh, I like this op option. The second, uh, I'm neutral. The third is, I don't like it. Or the fourth is, I'd need more information. Great. So about half of you have responded, so we'll keep it open a little bit longer. Okay, we're going to close it shortly, so if you want to make a selection, make that now. Okay, great. Let's take a look. Hmm. So the results are saying that 8% um, like the option, 13% neutral, 42% do not like it, and 38% would like to know more. Great, thanks. Thanks, Maggie. All right, so now we get to the point where we want to get some feedback uh, um, and, and begin to look at prioritizing some of the options out there. And we held a meeting um, Thursday, October 27th, a three-hour meeting at the Jewish Community Center in Whitefish Bay. Um, I'll note here that the attendance was low, uh, we had 10 people uh, from the, the public there, and we used our traditional methods of getting things out, but clearly they didn't work as well as we wanted. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future, but I do want to represent that, uh, that unlike the summer meetings where we had a healthy attendance, we didn't have quite that much here at this meeting. Um, we had, again, the welcome and introductions. We, uh, we had a short presentation about the status of the integrated assessment to date, and then we did a couple exercises. One was a sticky dot exercise that uh, related to themes of the hopes and wishes and concerns and issues and a rating exercise of the options. And then again, that very important re reflection at the end. Um, so uh, this kind of shows uh, uh, what the, 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 uh, the posters look like and you can see some of the sticky dots on there. Again, a very, very useful uh, forum for people to begin to have discussions besides uh, sharing what resonated with them as far as people's um, hopes and wishes and issues and concerns uh, reflected during the summer. So I'm going to share the next uh, five slides or so are going to be themes uh, from the, the sticky dot exercise in our five themes, the first theme being lake levels. Um, and what resonated, the questions of what factors uh, influence lake levels. There was definitely a desire for more scientific information about lake level change. Can lake levels be controlled? And there was a, a statement um, uh, from, uh, from, from somebody at that meeting that said, uh, if all the money spent on shore protection around the lakes was pooled, it could pay for a control structure. So uh, just uh, a comment uh, at that meeting. Erosion is the next theme. And, the, and the, the, what resonated was, why is erosion happening? What are the causes? What's the relative influence of lake levels, uh, surface and groundwater, and adjacent shore structures? There was interest in an online tool to track erosion down to the property level to see what influence uh, structures might have on erosion. And finally, um, there was concern expressed about erosion on property values. The next theme is uh, our resources and support, and there was a desire to see some sort of government role to provide support to property owners. There was a strong desire for financial and technical support for shore projects, but in lieu of this, could there be some set of recommended solutions or a list of reliable contractors supplied to make the decision to go forward with something like that um, uh, easier to do? 
And then finally, there was a strong desire to learn from other projects, both successful and unsuccessful, when people have taken um, shore protection measures, what's worked and what hasn't worked. And then uh, under the theme of regulation and management, there was a desire for a clear definition of both people's rights to protect their property and the regulations that are out there on their actions. And for bluffs, what can be done, what are the next steps that could be taken uh, to limit other people's projects that might generate negative impacts. And then finally, there was a desire for consistency uh, of, of, of bluff uh, uh, setback ordinances or, or response um, ordinances across municipalities. And then finally, under this area of collective action, a strong desire for coordinated solutions among neighbors. And this kind of more informal network had more support than formal mechanisms that came up over the summer, um, such as uh, neighborhood improvement districts. And then um, uh, specific comments uh, included uh, caution at developing formal frameworks for cooperation due to the issues were potential fees and taxes that could be imposed on people. And then um, looking at some of the larger regional frameworks uh, response options, there was, a, there was support there for shoreline habitat conservation, but less interest in formal regional frameworks. So that, uh, that kind of does that first exercise in that October 27th meeting. The second um, here, and you kind of are seeing some of this polling here, we had turning point uh, audience response devices. And the questions that we asked of these options were, uh, I like this option, I'm neutral on it, I don't like it, or I'd like to know more information. And so here's a practice question that we give so you can kind of see how this system works when you're going through a presentation. And you have to recognize here that October 27th, we had just, uh, the, the second uh, game of the World Series um, had just uh, uh, finished and it was tied 1-1 and is about ready to move to Cleveland. So we asked, uh, will the Chicago Cubs win their first World Series since uh, 1908? And yes or no are the answers. And uh, if I'm moving forward here, supposedly, there we go. We, uh, uh, the, we had 78% of the people who saw the future, I guess, and, and saw, saw that the Cubs will win. So you can kind of see how, the, how, uh, how, how we went through the other 29 options. We went through these types of questions. So just to, to quickly summarize um, uh, the response options, under the category of structural options, in general, the greening of conventional approaches was viewed most favorably. There was interest, moderate interest, in some of the gray infrastructure pack practices with the revetment coming out uh, as the favorite option of those six that we mentioned. Under the green um, options, the living shoreline options, there was some interest in, in greener approaches, but there was a very strongly expressed tentativeness about their effectiveness in open lake, high energy wave environments. And again, the, the combination approaches um, were the most highly liked of the structural approaches. When we kind of skip over and go to outreach and tools, pretty much near universal support, that's where we had some of our, 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 our complete uh, uh, you know, eight to zero or whatever votes uh, in, in the particular categories here. And uh, then finally looking at policies, there was definitely support for a collaboration, uh, more informal collaboration, but people wanted more information on the specifics of any new policy initiatives. Um, again, you can see cooperation and collaboration amongst neighbors were strongly uh, favored. Um, the, the, the legal framework, such as a neighborhood improvement district, less favorable. Moderate support for a larger uh, authority to kind of look at the uh, uh, broader scale um, uh, solutions here. Um, there was definitely favor for changing permit practices to ease approval of breakwaters or groins or promotion of green practices. And then finally, there was, uh, and this particularly looks at the kind of future conditions, um, there was favor for a, a policy review mechanism that would allow for quicker uh, responding regulations. So an example, a trigger mechanism there, an example might be, let's say that uh, water levels exceed a certain level that would trigger a review of the ordinance to make sure it was still working. So that's what that's what that means. Um, so the following morning, October 28th, we had a meeting to share what happened at that evening meeting with our local officials and partners. And we had uh, an attendance of 26 total. Nine of those were our project team. Um, Ten represented local governments. Four were elected officials. Five were staff from planning or engineering departments and one county staff. We had seven partners, mostly state agency representatives, one regional planning commission staff, and a nature center staff. 
And some of the concerns there, like I had mentioned earlier, there was a concern expressed about the low turnout at the evening and suggestions for other ways that you could obtain feedback about the response options. Um, there was a closing reflection that shared appreciation from many different people involved in that meeting about the level of outreach that's been associated with this integrated assessment. And at the end, there was also a call for a few people to lead community action on some of the options. And a couple people, uh, one local and one regional representative, offered pending more information and input from community members. And I think because we're at such early stages, there was kind of a cautious approach taken here. There was, uh, in private conversations, there was uh, maybe some more interest in going forward, uh, but it, a lot more information um, will be needed. And it kind of uh, speaks to kind of the long-term nature of an integrated assessment like this. So kind of hitting the home stretch here. Uh, our next steps, first of all, are um, phase three of this integrated assessment where our findings get folded up with the other three teams into a regional report, but we're actively starting to work together with investigators and our partners and local officials to further uh, uh, refine response options. Um, they could be scheduling additional public meetings for prioritization of the options or maybe one-on-one -on -one meetings as well as uh, the possibility of an online survey uh, to support prioritization of options. And then finally here, um, uh, we know that the University of Michigan is, uh, has been the sponsor of many integrated assessments, and we want to be one that works in the long term. So we're really going to take a look at what creates staying power for an integrated assessment. So with that, Maggie, our last poll question. question is, what method do you favor to gather more feedback on response options developed as part of the Wisconsin Integrated Assessment? So options are one-on-one -on -one meetings with local officials and property owners, or additional public meetings, an online survey, or no opinion. Okay, so again, that's about half of you. Okay, we're going to keep it up in just a few more moments. So cast your final vote. And we'll take a look. Oh, pretty evenly split. A quarter of you one-on-one -on -one meetings, 30% additional public meetings, 22% an online survey, and 23% no opinion. Great, thanks, Maggie. So uh, that's it for my presentation. I wanted to put up uh, information about how to get in touch with me, and uh, uh, we've got kind of a basic project website that will probably be expanding um, over the next month or two. And uh, we've certainly got a lot of resources that can be shared through, uh, through box folders. I will say that we just um, kind of wrapped up our phase two report yesterday, and we're, we'll be starting to send that out to people. And probably when we send it out, we'll also um, send out um, the, 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 um, the, uh, our, our planning grant final report as well as our phase one synthesis report so that people can start to digest um, uh, what's happened here. So I guess with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Dave, for all the, uh, for the great presentation, all the great information, and also for the, the work that your team has been doing uh, for the past year plus. It's really been uh, uh, wonderful to work together and to kind of see your work uh, progress over time in the way that you've uh, worked with uh, your stakeholders uh, around this topic. So at this point, we're going to open it up to, to questions. And Maggie, do you just want to remind folks how they are able to submit questions? Yeah, um, don't be shy. Um, the question box in the console, if you just type those in, um, the question will go to me and Lello, and we'll, we'll get through those and, and make sure to share those so we can ask Dave and John some questions. So um, one of the questions that we got was from earlier in the presentation, noting that there are both dunes and bluffs in Ozaki County. Um, and this person was wondering whether the increase in shore protection included both shoreline types or only the bluff areas. Dave? So that, uh, those, those figures that I gave from Dave look at the entire county. So that 9.3% uh, uh, or whatever to, uh, uh, to 27 percent increase would represent um, armoring of the entire county and so Ozaki County has bluffs um, 
uh, from their south county line up uh, past the, the city of Port Washington, and then it goes down to a lower lying level area. And so that trend that we saw represents the, uh, the whole area. I don't have um, a breakdown, although Dave could probably do that, on that northern low area, um, what's, what is the, uh, the percentage um, of, of armoring there versus the, the bluff areas? I don't know of a breakdown, but that could be done. Great, and we're starting to get a few more questions in, so. Yeah, um, so of course a comment to share as well as a question. Um, so one of our attendees um, sort of sees an adaptation solution as being simple, um, to stop letting people build along eroding shorelines and that the knowledge of bluff erosion has been around for decades and that this person's noticed that policy has lagged behind um, and knows it's time for policy makers to step up. Um, so my questions are related to that. Is, can you talk about some of the recent legislative changes that have happened in Wisconsin that might sort of change the framework and context for evaluating these options now? Sure. Well, just just generally, we looked at uh, back when we, in our phase one report, um, our synthesis report, we were supposed to look at status and trends and causes and consequences. And so one of the, the trends that um, that, that, that I mentioned in that earlier report was there seems to be a trend in our state, particularly probably reflected at the state level, towards favoring private property rights. And so, um, you know, it, and I think that it's reflected through some changes that have happened at, at the state level um, for, for shoreland zoning, some um, loosening of restrictions, probably more geared at inland lakes, but they also could have influence for some, um, some uh, counties uh, uh, along the Great Lakes coast. Um, and there's a lot going on there, but uh, uh, just, just, you know, uh, generally, um, you know, there are some ordinances um, in our study area at the municipal level of dealing with bluff setbacks. Those aren't really covered by the changes that have happened. Um, and there are some county level um, regulations on the shoreline, but they're not representing the, representing, or, or re referencing the uh, ordinary high water mark. And so they're in pretty good shape um, uh, there. So, um, you know, so there's a, there's a little bit um, out there about, uh, uh, about some of the trends that we've been seeing. Great. Another question is whether the setback ordinances in Wisconsin vary based at least in part on the long-term erosion rate for the given shoreline reach. Um, some of the, um, uh, the some of these uh, uh, setback ordinances in uh, uh, local governments along our coast are based on a model ordinance that goes back to the 1980s and 90s, and they factor in bluff stability as well as, in some cases, um, um, long-term recession rates. So, in, so those those uh, ordinances that kind of go back to that date that were kind of adopted by those local governments include those two elements. But not, you know, every, every ordinance isn't, isn't the, exactly the same. Great. We have another question, um, sort of more on the structural side, wondering if, if there's a method of shore protection that permits longshore transport of sediment to continue, um, and sort of was longshore transport a concern um, as, as of this project? Um, I probably need to, uh, to to ask our engineers and geologists for a little bit more help uh, in this area. My background is in urban regional planning and and geographic information systems, and so um, I, I I think that uh, that that you may uh, turn around and ask that question of me, and I'll share it out to our broader team. That's great. And part of our plan with these questions, if we don't get through to all of them, we're going to prepare a, a summary from all these sessions that will be posted on the website. So that's fine, Dave, if uh, you need to share that question out with your team and we'll fold that into the, to the summary uh, as soon as possible. Let's see, we have another question. Someone says, thank you for sharing your work. Sounds like a great project. Um, can you say more about why the sort of more sparsely attended meeting on the 27th um, and the local officials meeting on the 28th were offered separately. Um, and so, you know, this person notes that it seems like these groups might benefit from discussing together, but, you know, also recognizing hindsight, you might see things right. differently. Yeah. Um, so, so it certainly was the case that local officials were invited to the, um, to, to the, uh, the Thursday evening meeting. Um, I, I, what we did, you know, what we wanted to do was to quickly turn around and share what we learned at that evening meeting um, with our, our broader partners and local officials 
uh, and kind of kind of get it while it was fresh in our mind. So that was the purpose of scheduling that meeting. I think as we go forward, um, you know, I, I, I think we'll look at, at at meetings that maybe are focused a little bit more on 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 municipalities or maybe a collection of one or two municipalities um, to be able to to. To, to begin to bring people together in that regard. Um, but, the, but for the previous meeting, you know, we hope for a broad representation of the public, which certainly, certainly the meetings during the summer included both um, uh, uh, many property owners and local officials and government staff at those meetings. And I, I, I kind of hope that uh, they would attend that October 27th meeting. Uh, we're certainly gonna go back and, and work on, uh, you know, how we notify people about, about meetings because you know what we did for the summer didn't work for us so well um, in late October and so we're going to have to reach out um, even stronger for, for any meetings and engagement opportunities that we we have moving forward. Great. Um, there's sort of a question about um, the effectiveness of the different approaches. So someone asked whether the study is looking at um, effectiveness of the various treatment types being considered or if there have been any other studies that attempt to assess treatment effectiveness. Huh. Well, I think that uh, that may be something that we could start to reach out to um, uh, a little bit more when it, when it becomes or as it becomes clear that there are some uh, particular approaches that, uh, that 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 there's a, a lot of um, interest in. So I think we can dig in a little bit deeper and kind of I think that's the kind of information that local governments and property owners would need to decide whether or not they they move forward. I think some of that is out there. Some of it might be new research that we'd have to do that would be identified as part of this this progress. And again, I'd probably, I think that if I had uh, Gene Clark or, or 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 Chin Wu or or Dave Michelson here, they'd be able to give you a uh, uh, an answer, a much better answer than that uh, than, than than I'm able to right now. Okay. I think we've got time for about uh, two more questions. Okay, great. There's a question about, um, do you have a sense of what proportion of property owners in the area are currently thinking of adding a shore protection structure? And so relatedly, is there an event that seems to trigger the need for shore protection for a property owner? Um, I don't know of the percentage. I do know that there are people out there looking at it because um, in some cases they, they mentioned that at the meetings that they've attended to and they certainly have in some cases also talked with our coastal engineering outreach specialist about some of these topics. I don't know, I don't have a quantification of the number of people out there. It may be just something that, that county staff or local staff or uh, maybe Wisconsin DNR staff might be able to say something about. Um, and again, what was the uh, what was the second half of that question? Oh, the trigger. second half is: Is there some sort of event that seems to trigger the need for that on a on a property? It seems to be driven by by the rise in water levels and and and, and active erosion happening. Oftentimes, I mean, that certainly seems to be the case that's driving things south of uh, uh, south of Milwaukee and Racine and Kenosha County. Um, so just, just to take a slightly different approach, um, I thank all of you who are sending in questions. It looks like we've got some folks who have some experience on these. So Dave, um, I can share with you afterwards some comments about um, longshore transport being a concern and how that can be difficult to measure and um, how some folks in your area are looking at that. And similarly, there's someone who's noting that their experience with revetments during the last high water period is that they're now having negative effects to adjacent property owners in many revetments. Um, and can prohibit shoreline walking. So I'll be sure to share these comments with you, Dave, so you can take those into consideration as well. Um, and then just one last question. Folks were wondering whether you had before and after project photos that you might be able to share, particularly a sort of perhaps gray infrastructure failures or um, successes? Well, we, we do have um, oblique photos that are uh, available for the 1970s and 2007. Um, that Dave Michelson has, has taken. They're available through a site um, that the Association of State Floodplain Managers hosts, um, uh, and it's available through our state's coastal atlas and probably other uh, sources as well. So that lets a comparison of 1970s and mid-2000 um, photographs. There are photographs that were um, high-resolution photographs taken in 2012, and as part of our project, um, uh, photos in August of 2016. And so one of the things I think that we'd be able to do is to uh, tr help to try to make those photos 
available so that that type of comparison can happen. And we've been um, experimenting a little bit with a, a tool um, that the Knight Lab at Northwestern University has developed called Juxtapose JS um, that allows you to take photos like that and develop a slider bar so you, you can kind of move that slider bar and see before and after conditions. And we're pretty excited about what that might be able to do and we've done it for a couple sites. I think we need to spend a little bit more time there, but that might be the kind of tool that would can help help people with this um, th this kind of ish, uh, interest in, in information. Dave, do you know, is that like the, the NOAA tool that was introduced at one of our early meetings? I don't know if you remember that. Um, with the lake level viewer? With the lake level viewer? Or is well, that the, yeah, that's a little bit different. So the, the lake level viewer has got a slider bar that lets you look at the areas that would be inundated or exposed at, at six foot increments from kind of the long term average. And they do have a place in a couple locations. I don't know that there's very many Wisconsin locations where you can click on it and do something called Canvas, a photo visualization of what water levels would look like. This would be this this can take any two photographs and throw them into a little interface that allows you to move a slider bar back and forth and kind of compare the change. And I think there are many kind of GIS tools out there that are beginning to incorporate this kind of slider bar, look at two different things. Um, uh, uh, but I haven't seen that capability in the lake level viewer. Great, great. Well, we're coming up on one o'clock. Uh, Dave, I just wanted to give you a minute or two if there's any kind of Final thoughts, either you know, from the from the polling results or from the questions. Any other kind of final comments you wanted to make before we wrap things up for today? Well, I will say that a lot of the detail that you are seeking um, uh, is expressed in the, uh, the the phase one and phase two reports, the, the the synthesis report in phase one and the response options report in phase two. So please, you know, keep tuned. Uh, send us your emails if you're interested in uh, being notified. Uh, Deidre Peroff, our social scientist, maintains a, a mailing list using constant contact, and when when you know when we when we uh, send out um, links to these reports, which will probably happen pretty quickly, you'll be able to be notified about them. So let us you know use my email address. Send us. Uh, uh, you know, send us uh, if your, your email and let us know that you're interested about this. We'll uh, include, in, uh, include you in, 